Yeah, yeah. Stellify is, is it short fiction? Is it a novel? Nobody knows, really. I think, it, yeah, I think it's, I've been calling it a novel in fragments. And I think that's probably right. And uh, it start, it came out of, um, came out of from, yeah, little pieces of microfiction um, related to the film industry. And kind of initially I was interested in the stories of um, actresses who had been sort of chewed up and spat out by the film industry. And um, I wrote a kind of a sequence of these sort of, um, I suppose creative nonfiction pieces about these, the stories of certain actresses. Um, and then the collection just spiraled out from there and I started kind of writing longer pieces of short fiction and then sort of knitting them, knitting them together, trying to interweave them a little bit. So that's what it is. Who knows what it is? I don't know. Um, but I'm going to read uh, a, uh, I'm going to read three pieces of, yeah, three kind of micro pieces uh, about the lives of actresses who have been chewed up and spat out. Um, by the film industry and these pieces kind of form a, a sequence which um, recur throughout the entire piece and you can try and guess who they're about if you if you're that way inclined um, so the first of these three pieces is called Isabel he sees her in the Place de la Madeleine whilst driving past with his secretary. She's 20 yards away and 15 years old, and he likes her at once. He's been auditioning girls for the part all day. Stuck in traffic flow, he sends his secretary out to approach her. Her heels clip-clop the cobbles as she trots, and Isabel responds to the call to the hand on the crook of her arm. He sees in the rear view, below the brim of his American hat, over the rim of his Ray-Bans as the traffic sweeps him along that his secretary points out the car and the girl getting distant now, 15 years old, blonde, curvaceous in her sweater and A-line, her hair pinned back, looks and maybe she sees the shape of his American hat through the rear window as he is swept away. The part is a good one a coquettish minx lost on the streets of Pigalle. She appears barely two minutes into the feature, catching the eye of the hero, Bob, as she rides off through the glistening Montmartre pre-dawn on an American sailor's scooter, picked up and whisked, whisked off for whatever teenage girls in tight sweaters and A-lines are whisked off for by muscular war veterans. And Bob, 50, laconic, adored by all, watches her with a hint of longing. He comes back the next night. She comes back the next night, big eyed and blonde and wrangles her way into Bob's home. She wants to sleep with him. She makes that clear. Bob, the gentleman, takes care of her instead, puts her to bed alone. He keeps his desire to have her, her lovely teenage body on the inside of his 50 year old head. Your character represents the kind of girl who has been around all my life, the director tells her. Very young, very high heels, making no distinction between good and evil. Isabel nods, nods, listens as he talks, blowing cigar smoke, his hat off, an egg-shaped head exposed, his secretary fussing with production assistants beyond. No distinction between good and evil, he says, and instantly he clicks his fingers in her face, burning their wings under the impression that they are really living. Yes? He is not smiling and he is waiting for her agreement, which she gives with a nod with his large warm hand on her forearm. He seems to enjoy her agreement. He relaxes into his cigar. Beautiful girls, he says, eyeing the distance, dark circles bearing his eyes, his eyes which he so often covers. Beautiful girls 
who are soon trapped and ground down. He fixes his eyes on her by the city of men. Because, of course, a city belongs to its men, no? She has everything it takes to be a big star. Beauty, intellect, the right age. He frames her breasts in the bedsheets the way a patissiere would frame a viennoiserie. She is, at the time of shooting, 16 years old. In the feature, she wants Bob and Bob wants her, but Bob, much loved gentleman thief, resists. Instead, he shepherds her into a dalliance with his young protege and son figure, Paolo. They use his studio apartment with the slanted windows letting in the miasmic pig owl light for their rendezvous. Bob returns one dawn, finds them in bed, naked under the sheets, asleep, and watches over them with a sort of melancholia. He has got what he wanted, what he planned, shipped them together, the only way it can be, what with him being an honourable man. But he wants the girl, that much is clear. She is a beautiful young girl, and he is still a man. These are the ways of things, and he is a good man. The director signs her to a long-term contract, but forgets about her. He is a busy man. Now that was Isabel. You may have recognized, if you're into the French New Nouvelle Vague, you may have recognized the director with his American hat. And you may or may not have heard of the actress. She's quite little known now, actually. Her name is Isabel Corrie. The next piece. I have to find the page. The next piece is called Jean. Here we go, Jean. Against the odds, the director casts her as Joan of Arc when she has no experience whatsoever to speak of, only dreams and the kind of large eyed, smooth skinned beauty of a girl child. Later, she remembers being burned at the stake twice, once on set under the monocular gaze of the German director's viewfinder and three dozen crew members, and once when the reviews came in. This is before FBI COINTEL, of course, but in hindsight, incidents aren't always so easy to separate. Timelines, not always monodirectional. She walks into the Parisian bedroom, location, no sets for these French directors, as a character she will later claim not to care for. A crop-haired, breezy American in a narrative enamored of national stereotypes and the definitions that separate men from women. She dozes in the bed with Jean-Paul, smooth-chested, atlas-bodied, flat-nosed casuist Jean-Paul. She is a tool of collocation. In the 23 minutes of the shoot presented in cinemas, later on video, DVD, stream, she will become something not exactly timeless, but existing in a different designation of time to the one she walks through daily. People will say they have fallen in love with her, with what they see of her, of her as this character in what is shown of this shoot. And this is still before FBI COINTEL, years before, though not many. David, her brother, of course, died in a car crash when he was 18. Francois, her husband, beat the shit out of her before attempting to launch his directorial career with her mid-estrangement as his star. La recreation, estrangement, a funny word, from the French, estranger, like the Camus, as if strangers is a state you can return to. Perhaps it is a different you, a different pair of the pair of you, because it seems the past version will always be intimately acquainted with that past Francois, the one who was still just a lawyer, 
his celluloid ambitions discreet. And then there was Romaine, sweet Romaine, who had his moments, but never beat the shit out of her. He saw the men who followed her, the cars parked outside their apartment, heard that insectoid hum and click click when he picked up the phone. The story they fed to Newsweek about the Black Panther fathering her baby, it fell straight from the Metaplan. Cause her embarrassment and cheapen her image, says the memo. You can read it yourself. The story wasn't true, of course. The baby, in fact, belonged to Carlos, the revolutionary who she'd had an affair with on the set of, of, a, of the Mexican Civil War drama. But Romaine, decent Romaine, said it was his. She said she was his. A little girl born early, weighing four pounds, a little tiny flickering speck of starlight, a few pulses of woolly lids over blurry retinas, a few days of earthly light, like a match you strike that doesn't catch. On the day that Jean's body is found, decomposing in a blanket in the back seat of her Renault in the 16th arrondissement, her next of kin is an Algerian conman who sold her apartment for 11 million francs so he could open a restaurant. Shall I say who it was about? I oh, will. It was about Jean Seberg, Jean Seberg, Jean Seberg from uh, Abu Dasuf, whose story is, is mind blowingly sad. And I think that the, the, way that, the way that sexual predation has been normalized by Hollywood is something that becomes very troubling when you study film, which is what I do when I'm not writing prose. And the, the way that that spiders into the real life experiences and lives and deaths of particularly actresses I think is something that is worth reflecting on a little bit. That is why I wrote that. And here is the last piece, uh, which is called Lindsay. He said, scrolling quickly to the page. But not quickly enough. There we go, Lindsay. They will call you a veteran when you are 10 years old. Your performance as two identical sisters will be described as soulful and adept, and the film will earn $100 million. Are there 100 million stars when you look up in your 10th year on the planet, little veteran? Draw a square and count, there just might be. How about when you look up age three? Three-year-old Ford model signed and contracted. Are there a hundred million bubbles in the soda as it spills? A hundred different colors in the photographer's eyes? A million O's in the bowl? Are there a hundred million hearts stuffed within your father's shirt? And if there are, how many of them love you? The woman who plays your mother knows a thing or two. You're practically fully grown now, ripe for plucking. And she waltzes through that vineyard world of pluckers like she hasn't got two single fucks to give. She makes you laugh. She's a joker. The two of you switch bodies. Imagine as you're studying her vocal patterns, how her body would really feel. Can you fill it up right to the corners? the tips, split your consciousness and walk around in her tights for a bit. Feel the background chainsaw buzz ebb away to nothing. Isn't that nice? Does it remind you of being two? Can anything remind you of being two? Can any portal transport you back to those days of comforters 
before the photographer's eyes aimed themselves at you? No, you need another body for that. It is hardly surprising, really, when the world decides that it's done with you. Perhaps the world has a maximum capacity for love. At some point, we're just too tired to be kind. At some point, we are sick to fucking death of you. At some point, we require you to plunge head first into your nosedive. At its terminus, we will finally be able to reassess you, perhaps even to love you again, to appreciate the things we once appreciated in you, to see the child we have ceased to be able to see, to stop masturbating to pictures of you, to stop taking pictures of you over your garden wall, to stop writing articles about your failings, to stop reading articles about your failings, to stop wanting to know about your failings, to stop enjoying your failings, to stop enjoying your losses, to stop enjoying your destruction. Because at that point, your destruction will have finished. And you will be once more small, big-eyed and adept forever. And we can all appreciate that.